Welcome to the Chesapeake Forum. We'd like to give you a little presentation about best practices for doing hybrid presentations. I'm Doug Holly, and I'm here with Jody Rennie, and we're going to cover some of the lessons that we've learned as we've done presentations in the past. In the old days, you'd go down to the forum, it was easy. You'd go down to the forum, give a presentation, you spoke, you didn't have to deal with technology, people understood what you were saying. And then we had COVID hit, and although it was a painful period, there was a couple of good things that came out of it. One of them being, we learned how to Zoom, how to communicate effectively, electronically and visually, so that we could share information and have engaged discussions and learnings. Which brings us today, which we want to talk about how to deal with a hybrid where you have students in the classroom with you, so there's one audience, and you also have a virtual audience. And we think it's important to keep in mind that there are two different audiences that you're going to be presenting to, and there's a few techniques that you should use to effectively communicate with both audiences and keep both audiences engaged. The other thing is the logistics. There's a lot of technology, which gives us some very powerful capabilities, but there's a lot of logistics with it, but you don't have to worry. We'll handle that part for you. We'll handle the tech, the setup, the monitoring of the chat function in the Zoom in case the users type any questions. We'll mute those noisy connections when somebody answers the telephone or starts talking to somebody else. Um, we'll monitor the sound and the video so that you don't have to worry about it, and we'll make sure that it gets recorded. And you'll coordinate with Trina Horner. She'll be the one who will handle a lot of this, and she'll particularly be the one that'll work with you on the dry run that we do to help make sure everything goes smoothly. So let's talk about a couple of things getting ready for it. One to two weeks before the class, you should have your presentation prepared. It's important to get it to us so that we can take a look at it and make sure everything comes across well. Uh, we want you to conduct a dry run, as we said with, with Trina, to make sure that both your presentation and any other materials you have are good. And also if you have handouts, if you could prepare them as a PDF and send them to Trina or email the distribution one week prior so that they have the material. We generally don't hand out hard copies. Some considerations to think about when doing this. Um, if you're going to use any video or audio files to share, because those sometimes can be very effective in making a point, um, try to embed them, which means a PowerPoint will allow you to embed an audio file in it so that it plays automatically. Or you can have a link and um, Trina can activate the link and play like a YouTube video or an audio file. And we'd ask that you also put them on a thumb drive. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Make sure you share your presentation with Trina, uh, email or a thumb drive. Um, if you do a PDF, it's usually small enough to be uh, emailed. And we ask that you do it in either PowerPoint or a PDF format. Those are the formats that we've consistently found we can work with successfully. Also, you want to sort out who's going to do what when you're doing your presentation. Are you going to advance your slides or is Trina going to advance your slides? Do you want Trina to monitor the chat or do you want to monitor the chat yourself? Those are some of the things that the two of you will work out. And how are you going to handle Q&A? One of the things to think about is do you want questions to come in as you're presenting, or are you going to um, ask them to hold questions till the end? You want to define those things up front. As we mentioned, um, we want you to bring your pr presentation. We'd like you to email it to us, but we would like you to also bring it on a um, drive, thumb drive. The reason is in case something happens, it doesn't work, we've got a backup, and also anything that you want to display associated with it. If you're a Mac user, you want to ask the Mac to format it as a FAT32. Once again, if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to us and we'll help you with that. If you're a PC user, PC automatically uses a FAT32 format. Then the day of the program. 
bring your slides on that thumb drive, bring any material that you're going to use. Um, we'd ask you also to think about how you're going to dress. Um, your top or shirt should be a simple uh, thing. Avoid a busy pattern. Sometimes that doesn't come well, come through well on the video. Arrive about 30 minutes early so that we can get things set up. Trina will help you test the sound, the slides, and the media to make sure everything's working well. And please remind Tr Trina of your setup. We run about 30 programs. It's a lot to keep track of. So we would ask that you tell her how you want the room set up for the event that you're doing. Then when you're all ready to go, take a breath. You want to engage both audiences in the presentation, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Take your time. Engage for the first couple of minutes as you have signed on in some unrelated banter. You want to take a couple of minutes to just talk to people, get people comfortable, give people a chance to get their Zoom activated, get people a chance to settle down. Maybe you want to have a little icebreaker, a little story to tell or something unrelated to the content that you're going to provide. And then it's showtime. All right. Well, that's great, Doug. Thank you so much. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the notes and bolts of what you're going to actually be doing as you're teaching in a hybrid environment. I started teaching hybrid long before COVID. I would have classes with 15 people or students on a screen, and I'd have 15 in the classroom. Doug already said this is like theater in the round. How you have the room laid out can impact how you're working, but Trina can help you lay out the best format, what we've learned over many years of doing this now, um, in order for you to best facilitate the type of lecture or discussion that you want to have. So keep thinking in terms of how am I going to reach this audience who's on a screen, and you can see them, and this audience that's right in front of me. Doug already talked about our PowerPoint and PDFs. Make it simple. People don't want to read your presentation. They could buy a book or, or go to the library. They want to hear your presentation. So keep those slides clean. If you do have that sound or video, please make sure that it's embedded or easy to connect to. I actually taught a course on Agatha Christie um, books, and I would go to BritBox, which is a subscription service, one of my favorites, but that was very awkward to bring in and out of the presentation, but I wanted to use the film clips. We figured out how to do it. That's where the dry run and the practice comes in to make that very smooth um, as you're transitioning from media. The next slide uh, talks about font size. So it's a kind of like the cute three bears we have here. You don't want it too big. You don't want it too small. You want it just right. <clears throat> We found that 32 point is probably about the best. And when you're using that size, that will help you reduce how much stuff you put on each slide. Next slide talks about fonts and the simplicity of them. And Doug's made this chart up for us and it talked about all, you know, shows you visually all the different fonts that you can use. Sometimes if you really want to um, embolden something that makes sense. But if it's too busy, too cluttered, it's hard for your reader to follow what you're trying to say. And it can actually be distracting. If you have a long quote, if you have something that you really want people to know about, put a citation where they can find that information. A lot of students are interested and they want to dig deeper. If you've told them the source, that's great. They can then later on either engage with you or they can go check out the source themselves. So the next thing we're going to talk about is engaging both your audiences. Um, this, is the, this is the exciting part as far as I'm concerned. One of the things you're going to want to do, let's go back to this thought of theater in the round, is you're going to want to address both audiences at the same time. We have folks that sign up for Zoom for quite a few reasons. One, mobility is difficult for them. Uh, two, they don't live in the area. And we've been very blessed with Chesapeake Forum that we're seeing more and more people who are attending our classes who do not live on the Eastern Shore. You also might have a situation where people are signed up to be in person, but for whatever reason, they attend by Zoom or vice versa. That's another reason we don't have handouts because we don't know how many people are actually going to be in the room 
And we want to make sure that our online attendees have the same handout that you do. You want to ask questions of, of your virtual audience as well as your in-person audience. And this can be a little bit awkward. So one of the things that I have found is basically have a batting order. And so I say, my question is, what did you learn from that video we just saw, the embedded video we just saw? And I'll say, Zoom folks, I'm going to talk to you first. As a matter of fact, I'd like to talk here from Sue, Harry, and Juan. And then I'll switch to the in-person audience. And that's a little bit easier. And then you go back to your virtual audience. Anybody else want to say anything? Make sure you call out their names. Their screen does not have people in the same order yours does. So you can't say, well, the third person from the right. Now, I have had some issues pronouncing particularly some of my foreign students' names. And so I'll say, look, I may not pronounce your name correctly, but you're wearing a pink shirt. And that tells them who it is that you're going to hear from. Another problem we sometimes run into with Zoom, the reason the person is taking the course via Zoom is they don't really want to be on screen. There are a lot of reasons for this one. Um, I teach a class in Peru, and the reason my students aren't on screen, and I teach to black boxes, is because they don't have the bandwidth or all of their family is home and their, some things are going on in the background. So they don't want us to see that, and I, and I actually appreciate that. You can call on someone. If they don't respond to you kind of quickly, pause. They're probably trying to fumble to get rid of that mute button, you know, turn it, turn it on, turn it off, whatever, and give them a couple of seconds. It may also be that they just don't want to answer. So don't keep calling on them. Just move on to the next person. You can also say, all right, I'm going to move on. But Doug, if you, if you want to say something, I'll come back to you at the end. That gives Doug an opportunity to fumble with the mute button, get his thoughts together, and then be able to participate in the conversation. But we don't want to set them up. We want to, we want to not catch them cold. Make sure you look into the camera. That can be a little awkward for some of us, um, but you do want to look into the camera when you can. If you're going to have a good discussion, and let's go back to people take these classes because they want to be engaged. It is a way, particularly for our, our folks that, that don't necessarily get out a lot for a variety of issues, it allows them to engage. You can turn off the screen. And Doug, why don't you, why don't we demonstrate this? Okay. So Doug is going to stop sharing in you would be using Trina and say, please stop the share. And you can make the whole thing disappear, and now it's just Doug and I. Isn't this a more comfortable conversation way for us to talk? Also, Much the pictures so. of the people in the room are going to be larger. So now we can have a discussion as a group, and we're not focused on the slide that just has words. All right, let's go back to the presentation. So let's talk about this raised hand thing. The raised hand is an emoji. Some people are comfortable using it, some people are not. And you can see the lady in the orange, she's used the hand emoji and she's waving her hand. She's really easy to figure out, she has something to say. Now you can see also this gentleman um, has quite a puzzled expression, the only gentleman on the screen has a very puzzled expression. He probably has a question and he may not want to ask it, he may be a little bit shy. Go ahead, say, hey, do you have a question? It helps if his name's on there, but do you have a question? I, I, you, you look puzzled or you look like you're thinking a, a great thought. We'd love to hear it. So go ahead and ask for help. Let people help you. Look at your audience, look them in the eye, particularly the people on the screen. Do they have a question or not? Do not let the folks with the black screens phase you. If they've chosen, and they can raise their hand, you'll see it on the black screen if their video isn't working or something, but, but just keep on going. There are people, they have a reason for being in the class. So moving on, we want to talk, briefly talk about show and tell. Show and tell is great. Um, we bring in artifacts we want to talk about. You know, if you've got a book, you hold up the book cover. It does not really go over well on Zoom. Um, the camera doesn't always focus on it properly, and it's really frustrating for our hybrid audience. So we recommend that you go ahead and bring those items in, but maybe you take a picture and include that in your PowerPoint presentation. Therefore, the, the virtual attendees can see it. 
Also, the presentation is available to the folks that are in your classroom, and they may like it if they ever go back and look at the presentation again. Remember, all of our handouts are shared electronically, so both audience have access to what it is that we're going to, what you're talking about. And so, moving on, we're going to talk about group discussions. Now, I don't think I've said this enough, and you can tell me that I have. Um, the idea is to engage our students. They want to learn something, but you are working with adults. Adults learn better by doing and by talking about it themselves, not being lectured to or read to. Now, some of you do great lectures, and, and by all means do that. I've heard wonderful lectures, but most adults want to be engaged. There's a couple things you can do. One, you can, like I said, pose a question, and then make sure you flip back and forth between your screen audience and your um, in the room audience. The other thing you can do is use a breakout room feature. And you're so lucky because you've got Trina here to work that for you. She can, um, when you say, you know, Trina, let's, we're going to break people out into breakout rooms, our virtual uh, audience members into breakout rooms. And she can arrange for people to be put in a room of three to four people. You pick the number. You'll arrange this ahead of time and they'll get together. She'll make them disappear into a breakout room electronically. And the three or four of them can have a conversation. They can engage. You might say, take five minutes to talk about this. And then what one person of the group to summarize what your group talked about. You can be doing the same thing with the people in the room. Have them quickly get into groups of four or five people. They can talk about the topic. Um, and some things that you might want to be uh, uh, consider are, uh, what did you learn from the last segment? What questions do you still have? How would you like to, what would you like to have us discuss in the next segment? So you can have people participate that are online in these discussions. And then Trina will make them magically appear into the big discussion as well. It allows them to engage with each other. It allows you, frankly, to have a little bit of a breather. And it allows you to find out the answers to the questions that you wanted to ask. So that's a, a good technique for holding this, the small group discussions within the, in the Zoom community. All right, we're, we're going to wrap this up. Um, people may be in the room, if you're viewing this um, while we're in one of the faculty forums, that's great. If we're not, by all means, reach out and ask someone. Doug's going to provide you with a checklist, which is a really helpful way to plan for your presentations. We have two audiences. Please remember that. This is audience in the round. Keep moving and looking at your screen audience, and then look back to your in-person audience. It becomes very natural as you practice doing it. The second is student engagement is huge. People want to be heard. And there's a lot of really good knowledge of people attending your classes. So why not benefit from what they have to offer? Be sure when you open, you do a little bit of banter while you're waiting for people to find that Zoom link or find the parking space, but limit it to just about three or four minutes. Remember, you have an hour and a half and then Zoom cuts you off. So keep the banter down, but don't start content. Include um, all your students online, in the room, raised hands work. Planning pays. Working with Trina to get this set up ahead of time, knowing what's going to happen, it will save you so much anxiety and stress. Now, stuff happens. And I was in a class where it did. And it worked 10 minutes before we started, and they ran into a problem 10 minutes after we got into the class. That's okay. Breathe. We've all dealt with technology that doesn't work. So it will be worked out, and it will be fine. Your students will understand. So relax and have fun. So thank you so much for being instructors and thank you for being willing to work in this hybrid community because it allows so many people to take your class, both in person or they can get the recording afterwards. And we at Chesapeake Forum really appreciate your efforts to grow our learning community. Back to you, Doug. Take care. And thank you again for offering to run a program for us. We certainly appreciate it.